Uh, what do you think the four worst words are in business? Here they are. That's not my job. <laughs> How many of you, have, be honest now, the cameras are watching. How many of you have ever said, that's not my job? How many of you have ever heard it said? Yeah. I was reading one author yesterday with regards to this. Uh, he said, if you ever answer someone important with, that's not my job, you will be right. <laughs> it won't be your job when you're terminated for being unimportant or useless. Look at that phrase, answer someone important. What if that someone important happens to be the Son of God, God, Jesus, who died on the cross to save us from sin and gave us a job? Can you imagine saying to that someone important, that's not my job? I can't. But it, it, it won't be your job when you're terminated for being unimportant or useless. Aren't you glad that God doesn't terminate? We'd all be gone. He doesn't terminate, but when we say that to Him, either by our actions or by our words, um, most of the time it's our actions, we miss out on the biggest blessing and privilege and pleasure of life, and that's being commissioned by Jesus and given a job. We're in the Gospel Mosaic. Would you join me this morning in Acts chapter 1? We're going to have to go fast. Um, I'll speak fast if you can listen fast. Um, let me give you just a quick rundown. Before time began, there was God. Everything starts with God. And then at the right time, God created. He created a beautiful world that we enjoy. And then He created man, man and woman. And as He created them, He created them in innocence, perfection. Uh, not as God, but they're representatives of God. He made them in His image. It wasn't long before they fell. Adam and Eve both sinned, and as a result, life was going to be changed dramatically from that point on, and everyone born in the world would be born in, with a fallen nature. And so God had a redemption plan in place from before the world began, and that kicked into place, and He began to work through people, through Noah, and then <clears throat> called out Abram and gave Abram a promise. He says, I'm going to make of you a great nation uh, from, your, from your seed, We'll, uh, uh, I'm going to bless all the nations of the world. I'm going to give you land. And then you, then you, you go from there and you, you look at the judges and go from the judges to kings and from the kings to the prophets. And during this time of the kings and the prophets, there was David. And God said to David, I'm going to, I'm going to take of your seed or of your, your offspring. And one from your offspring will sit on your throne forever and ever and ever. And of his kingdom, there shall be no end. And king after king came and went, no one fulfilling that prophecy until the fullness of time had come. And God sent forth his son, born of a woman, made under the law to redeem those under the law. It's an amazing, amazing thing. Jesus came, God came, and became flesh and dwelt among us. He lived among us. He grew and developed. And then the time came. Oh, <coughs> <clears throat> at approximately the age of 30, and he began his public ministry. Uh, he claimed to be God. He did the things that only God could do. He forgave sin. He performed miracles. And then he made his way to Jerusalem, where he was going to be crucified for the sins of mankind. He died on the cross for our sins, and that's the central point of the whole gospel mosaic, the narrative. This is it. It's the focal point of all human history, the cross of Christ. He was taken from the cross and buried. Three days later, he came forth from the grave, and what a great exclamation point that was on the work of Jesus on the cross. Now he's going to spend uh, uh, about 40 days ministering, preparing the disciples for life without him. Uh, and this is where we pick up the story. He prepares them to be a, a success, and he gives them a mission. Let's, let's start reading here in verse number 3 of chapter 1. He, Jesus, presented himself uh, alive to them after suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me. 
For John baptized with water, but you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And so when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up in a cloud, um, took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who is taken up uh, from you into, he- into heaven will come in the same way as you have seen him go into heaven. So Jesus spends these 40 days. He spent three years. But now after his uh, resurrection, he spends 40 days just preparing them. And they could, he said, I've given you many convincing proofs. You could touch me and know that not only have I died, but I've come forth from the grave. Touch me. Listen to me. And he gave them this commission and so that they were going to go out and preach the, the resurrection along with the cross of Christ as eyewitnesses. So he's giving them all that they need for convincing proofs. And then he said, I'm going to give you my Holy Spirit. It's interesting because the disciples ask a question. They said, uh, is this the time you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel? You never want to ask Jesus the wrong question. And he doesn't answer it. He said, basically, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons that are fixed in the mind of God. But here's what you do need to know. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the world. You will be my witnesses. Sometimes when people ask who we are, we answer the question with, I'm an engineer. Uh, I'm a school teacher. I'm a librarian. I'm a candlestick maker. Uh, these are, this is the way we answer the question. That's not who we are. Who we are are followers of Christ. And our ministry as witnesses is fleshed out as engineers, uh, as candlestick makers, as, as librarians, and whatever you are. That's the mission field to flesh out who you are as a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. You will be my witnesses. I grew up during a time period in the church where we were fascinated with the things to come. Anybody else like that? I remember more than once a week-long prophecy conference at our little church in Hastings, Minnesota. And along the front of the, the, the auditorium was this chart that had every color of the rainbow. There were demons on that chart. There were flying creatures. There were arrows. There were Bible verses. And you look at that, and if you could figure out all the arrows, you knew what was going to happen in the end time. People would identify who the Antichrist was, and people could identify the, uh, the, the time, the day that Jesus was going to come. When that happened, and it didn't happen, uh, they would readjust it. I remember reading, uh, the first one I remember reading about uh, identifying the date was 1843. A man said, as he gathered his followers up to the top of the mountain, he said, Jesus is going to come tonight. And so they were ready. They were all there with robes on, ready to be taken up by the Lord. Um, don't be shocked, but I tell you, it didn't happen. So when you set a date and it doesn't happen, you go back and you recalculate, which is what he did. He recalculated, and he was off by a year. So he gathered the group together in 1844 on the mountain to be taken up. That was the day the Lord was going to come. It didn't happen. I think you only get a couple strikes with that. Um, It happened again uh, in, in the lifetime of many of us, in 1988, a NASA scientist did all the calculations, and he wrote a book entitled 88 Reasons Why the Lord is Going to Come in 1988. He sold a bunch of copies. Um, it didn't happen. So he recalculated, and guess what he came up with? 1989. <laughs> you could get the books 1988 real cheap. In 1989, we are so enamored with the things that are important, 
but are not the most important. And Jesus said, it's not for you to know. You study prophecy, but not to the extent that it gets in the way of what we're supposed to be doing as witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. And so Jesus says, stay here. I've equipped you. I've given you signs. And I'm going to give you my Holy Spirit. You've got to wait here. And I give you my Holy Spirit. When he comes, the church will begin and you'll go out and share the gospel message. I read one commentator years ago as they watched him go into heaven. He said, that's what the church is doing today. Kind of gazing up into heaven. When the two angels said, why are you doing that? You've got a job to do. Why are you doing that? You saw him leave. He's going to come again. The same way he left. In fact, it's the same place. The Mount of Olives, just right outside of Jerusalem by the eastern gate. Looking down at Jerusalem, we, I've stood there many, many times. That Mount of Olives, and, the, and read this passage where Jesus is going to, did uh, ascend into heaven. But he'll come again. And so you have <clears throat> the first coming of Jesus as a lamb to take away the sins of the world. And then you have the second coming of Jesus all the way over here. Right now, it's almost 2,100 years later where he's going to come again at some time as a lion, bringing judgment on the world right to that Mount of Olives and then from there bringing judgment. And so between the two comings, we have this time that's our time and this job that's our job. And every one of us is here this morning because somebody took the words of Jesus seriously. You will be my witnesses. And even as I say that, some of you, uh, perhaps all of you who know Jesus, can go back in your minds, do it this morning. Who was that person who shared the gospel message with you? Was it a Sunday school teacher? Was it a mom? Was it a dad? Was it a camp counselor? Or was it, as we heard this morning, a professor of engineering? Who was it? Somebody took it seriously. And now it's our job. It's our job. Now, by the way, we take that seriously at Woodside. Um, we're here to reach our world, and we're pretty intentional about it. Uh, it's one of the things I love about this church. It involves so much. It involves us uh, 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 praying about this. It involves us uh, sharing the gospel message. It involves us giving. I, I'm, it's 10 years ago now, this, this coming fall, that we had a man here who shared with us the, the needs of the, uh, the children of Thailand. And uh, I remember saying at the close of that service, this happens, the, the, the sex trade, the human trafficking, all over the world. Uh, we can't save them all, but maybe God would have us save some children. And I said, whatever we're going to do, it's going to take money, let's take an offering. And at the close of that service, we took an offering, and if I remember correctly, it was like $35,000. And from that began a study that ended up with a 16-acre parcel and a foundation and an orphanage that has become a base to reaching the Aka tribe in six of those countries in that region. It's absolutely amazing. Many of those children that have come like this have all come to know Jesus Christ as Savior. And so this coming Saturday, you've heard about it, Jonathan's already shared with you. I am so excited about it. Uh, there are six families who support one of them. We're one of those six that support Salmon. He was just like this, but now after all these years, he's 17 years of age, and he'll be here with us uh, this coming Saturday night. Put it on your schedule. It's going to be a wonderful, wonderful evening. We do all kinds of things to reach people through neighborhood groups, through upward basketball, um, to try to reach them with the gospel of Jesus Christ. We've got the, uh, the uh, home plate ministry coming up where we partner with uh, Jeff and Carla Totten, uh, and uh, with, along with uh, you know, hundreds and hundreds of other churches and thousands go down to the ballpark, go to a clinic. And uh, the gospel is shared beautifully by ball players and former ball players. Hundreds every year come to know Jesus. If you have neighbors or your children who, uh, who like baseball, take them. Uh, there's a table set up in the foyer with more information. But folks, let's always be about that at Woodside, okay? We cannot say this is not our job. It's not our job. I read some time ago that 90% of uh, people in the church 
who thought that the job of the church was to meet their needs. When pastors were asked that question, 90% of pastors said the job of the church is to reach the world. I'm happy to tell you that at Woodside, we don't have that disparity, that we are together we're to, to meet the needs of our people and to equip them to reach the world with the gospel of Jesus. So we're going to be doing that as we have been all through these years. Now, flip over a page, if you would, to... This is chapter 2. What happened, it was, a, it was Pentecost, which is one of the great big Jewish festivals, uh, Acts chapter 2. So people were gathered around. It was really a festival of harvest to celebrate the goodness of God at the end of the harvest. And so they're all gathered together. <clears throat> Something unique about this festival is that they would celebrate the harvest. They were to invite the exiles, the sojourner, the non-Jews to be a part of that and to experience the blessing of God. And it was there that Peter stood up and started sharing about Jesus and who Jesus was. Talked about his death, his resurrection, and, and then challenged people to repent uh, and believe. And 3,000 people did it that day. And that was the day the church began. It was conceived before the foundation of the world. Jesus predicted it in Matthew chapter 16, where he says, Upon this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And this was its birthday at Pentecost, Acts chapter 2. And so these people were on mission to go out and tell the world, starting in Jerusalem, and then it began to spread through persecution, through Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the world, so that people came to know Jesus as Savior. But now what did the people do in the church? Notice in chapter 2, verse 42. And they devoted themselves. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their, their homes, they received their, their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. We read in this passage that these people took their job seriously as witnesses, now they took their job seriously as witnesses who were part of a body that's called the church. And there were several things that they had to do. They had to give attention to the apostles' teaching, the doctrine, the Word of God. Have you ever heard around here, belong, grow, and reach? That's it. In a nutshell, we're to belong to Christ and to the body of Christ. <clears throat> we're to grow. We have all kinds of avenues for that, from our Thrive classes on Wednesday night to neighborhood groups to Bible studies, uh, couples' Bible studies, men's Bible studies, women's Bible studies. Many of you are involved in your own personal Bible study, reading the Scriptures uh, every day. We have to grow. So that coming to know Jesus is not the end of a journey. It's the beginning of another journey to get to know Jesus better. So we're, we're, we're serious about that in this place. Uh, we're starting a new Thrive series this coming Wednesday, right here at uh, about a quarter to seven, I think. And we're, uh, we've spent uh, six weeks already in the book of Ecclesiastes. I teach this class, but there are lots of other classes to be taught in, in Thrive class. Come and grow to be more like Jesus. Uh, then it says in fellowship. Uh, most of our fellowship takes place in neighborhood groups. Um, I live... Uh, I live north of Clarkston, and um, it's not the end of the world, but you can see it from our deck. Uh, it's, uh, and we have two and a half acres there, and we enjoy it. I'm looking at some of our neighborhood group uh, people here, and uh, Rick and Kathy lead our group. Well, one of the families in our group is having problems with squirrels in their house. Just kidding. Anybody have that problem? So they shared it at our neighborhood group, and one of the guys in our neighborhood group says, uh, I'll take care of that. I'm not going to tell you how he did it. <laughs> but that family no longer has a squirrel problem. So if you have a squirrel problem, join our neighborhood group, okay? <laughs> we do life together, and we love each other, 
and we share together. The scripture says here, they had all things in common. And some people look at this as a proof text for communism. Nothing could be further from the truth. This was not forced, it was voluntary. And you have to know at this time with the famine in Jerusalem uh, that people were starving. And yet there were people that, had, that owned land. Well, these people that owned land, like Barnabas in the fourth chapter, sold their land, brought the money, laid it at the apostles' feet so that those who didn't have food could have food. So it was an amazing thing. They gave themselves to that. Uh, we have to give ourselves to that as fellow, in, in fellowship. Understand, we're all part of this body. Uh, we're all part of this together. We all have needs. Um, I, I love it that Woodside has taken that so seriously. I've shared with this, this with you before. For the summer, we'll be celebrating our 60th anniversary as a church. And probably for all but all those years, right up to June of 2009, every month we would take an offering that would, we call a deacon's fund offering. It would go to help people in our congregation who had a doctor bill they couldn't pay for or an electric bill or, or something like this, a car breaks down. Uh, we stopped taking them in 2009, basically because we didn't need to anymore. People respond to that series I preached on generosity and just began to meet the needs of one another or gave directly above their regular giving to our deacon benevolent fund. So the needs haven't gone down, far from it. The needs, as we've grown as a congregation, have grown a lot. But the needs have all been met because you guys get it. You're devoting themselves to the fellowship. And if somebody has a need and I can meet it, then I do it. That's our job. Folks, we're, uh, this is a big job we have, isn't it? It's a big job. We're out of time. Um, I'd love to talk with you more about this and just all that, all that we have to be as a church between the comings. This is our time. This is a huge job. Let's pray for each other that we would do it well. Let's be witnesses. When I think about Every Sunday when I come and, and speak to you guys at 10 o'clock, I love to look out and see people sitting in the same spots because uh, you, there was a lady in first service. She normally sits in the fourth row with her husband. She's on the aisle. He's next to her. They were sitting over there this morning at 8.30. It kind of threw off my world. <laughs> I talked with her afterwards. I said, what's, 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 going, on, what's going on with you? What's wrong? She said, well, we had our mother with us, so we had to sit over there. Um, I love to look out and see faces and see familiar faces. I love to see unfamiliar faces. But I, I, I see empty seats. In every service, we have empty seats. And to me, that's a reminder that every one of those empty seats represents a person who doesn't know Jesus yet. Right? Every one of those empty seats. And yet I, I have a hunch, I almost said I, I want to bet you, but I have a hunch <laughs> that every one of us here knows people who don't know Jesus yet, that maybe God would have us be witnesses, that God would through his spirit empower us to share and through his spirit draw them to himself and they, they would have a story that we could hear about as they're baptized and they fill up one of those chairs and they fill up another chair as God uses them and another and another and we grow together. Folks, this world is, is getting more and more challenging and it's going to be harder and harder um, to follow our faith. But this is our time. This is our time to be what God wants us to be as witnesses for Him. Let me say to you, if you don't know Jesus yet, it all begins with that. And at the close of our service, right in the front over here in front of this section, there'll be people there, wonderful people who, um, who know the Bible, who know Jesus. And if you're ready to, to take that step and follow him in faith, come and talk to one of them. Uh, we had dozens last week who came to know the Lord. Maybe you're some of those today. Maybe last week was the day you said, this is it, I'm stepping through that door by faith into the kingdom of God. May I say to you, uh, 
Welcome to the family. Welcome to the family. We're, you'll never, ever, 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 ever regret that. You won't. You won't. If you're at that place or if you have questions, come and somebody will talk to you afterwards. But also let me say, we're in this together. And if you have squirrels, <laughs> you may not have squirrels, but you may have some other issues going on that uh, maybe keep you awake at night a little bit. Maybe you got some stuff coming up this week and you're trying to handle it alone. You don't have to. We're family. Come and talk to somebody here. Of, um, and they'll, they'll be able to help you and pray with you. I, I read an email yesterday. I got it a few days ago, but it was too long to read at the time. It's not the longest email I've ever got, but it's in the top five. <laughs> and as I had time yesterday, I read the email. And as I read it, I wept. It was a story of a man and a family uh, who uh, had come to the end of themselves. And God had so worked in their life and brought them to a place of surrender. And he says, I gave my life to Jesus. It didn't solve all my problems, but it solved my biggest problem. And now I have Jesus who will work through the rest with me. And I read it and I thought, wow, that's, that's our mission. May that story be told a thousand times, a hundred thousand times through this job that's ours. Would you stand with me in prayer? And let's close our service today. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we are so grateful that you trusted us with this job. You've given us your spirit, and Father, we've seen you work in amazing ways. And Father, we're thankful for that. Continue to use us, Father, and we promise always to give you the glory for what you accomplished supernaturally in and through the witnesses of Woodside Bible. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, folks. Just know your love today.